Oh, my name's Tim Cook, by the way. Um, uh, Not that Tim Cook. Yeah, the real Tim Cook. Um, <laughs> I work with Morpheus. I'm an SA. Uh, I design solutions and help uh, customers implement their solutions with Morpheus. So um, I've worked both sides of the table. I've been a developer, and I've worked as an operations guy, and I've worked really heavily on both of them. So now I'm more on the DevOps, op, the DevOps side of things. So basically what I do is I want to help customers integrate this in as best as possible and integrate their automation. So what I've done here is I've, we create these workflows, and we, all the libraries and everything David showed you, we have an option to take those and build those into workflows, which can be submitted to an API. So for the sake of time, what I did is I actually took this and I ran the Jenkins process already. We can see here that everything passed. And so basically what I did is I took a, a, a container and I've got all my software built around that container. And that, then I pushed that container and I cloned the repository and I pushed it, I build the image and then I push that up and then I allow, then I build a, a template with Morpheus. So that template encompasses, a, it, it's, this is a very simple node <coughs> application that encompasses a MySQL instance and a, a Node.js front end. So that Node.js basically ties into MySQL and then it runs and shows you, here's my instance name, here's all my information, I can talk to my database. It's a very simple application. So the way this was run was basically it goes through and then once it's done with that, it posts this and creates this template here. So once this template is done, I can go into this application here, and from here I can execute this application, and I will run this from here, and give it a test, uh, give it a test group. Can you materialize your templates in the library? Can you materialize your template in the library? Visualize? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. So this is what I pushed. This mm -hmm. template was pushed with Jenkins. Okay. Once I ran my test and I pulled it, it's a very simple test. I pull everything down. I mean, you can obviously make a test a lot more complex. But as a developer, the, the, co the object is I want to write code. I don't want to be pushing buttons on a web front end. I don't want to be deploying instances. I don't care about any of that stuff. I want to see what my code looks like. I want to see what my application looks like when it's done. So, and I want to test the application. I want to be able to run it in multiple different environments and multiple different clouds. So as a developer, if I'm going to push my code to AWS, the front end, and then I'm going to test it on my local sandbox as well, that's you're going to have to rewrite a lot of stuff. There's a lot of differences there in how those different APIs talk to the back end. So with Morpheus, we abstract all that. We allow you to say, OK, I want to change what cloud I can go to. I want to, change, this is, I want to run my application in AWS, and then I want to run my application in my local VMware sandbox. Or I might just want to run it on my, uh, my uh, OpenStack environment and see how it looks. So I have the ability to do that through my code, I, through my Jenkins file and through my actual code that I'm pushing through. So once I run this, basically, this, this was built completely from Jenkins. So I, I'm gonna, this is going to deploy right now. So I'm going to go here and show you what this looks like as a template. So these are the components that it looks like. It brings all these different pieces in. It, it ties in my image, and it ties in the version that I want to push from. And this is MySQL. And these are very simple. I mean, you can make these very complex. The company I was at before Morpheus, when the company that actually introduced me to Morpheus, we had a 12-tier app. So it was a fairly complex application. We could deploy it in uh, VMware, OpenStack, AWS. And that allowed our developers and our QA teams to pull this down individually and run this in, you know, just by passing a couple different parameters to their configuration scripts. So if you have post commit hooks on your Jenkins, you push your code, as soon as you commit it, Jenkins starts running. So Jenkins will run the whole entire process and then commit it and push it if you want. So if you have your own environment and your own test cases, you say, you say where you want it to go, you push the code, Jenkins takes the pipeline, starts running it, deploys it. So developers never <coughs> see any of this. Developers don't need to see this. They have everything set up in advance. They don't need to see AWS. They don't need to see any of that. They don't need to know how to configure API because they're not operations people. They're developers. They develop an application. So can you scroll up to the visualization a little bit, the structure? Yeah. yeah. So are those components fixed fields within the orchestration tool? Or can I add additional components? So you can let's say absolutely. back up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can absolutely. You can add Or data protection. Yeah, you can add any kind of uh, custom preferences you want. Mm -hmm. So if you have options, you want to put any kind of options, then you can put 100 options in there if you want. And you can have those options populate into different values of config configurations as well. So when you push the actual image, you'd have those 
built into the, the configuration options. So from an operations perspective, if I wanted a specific data protection policy, or if I wanted to set some options for data protection, and my data protection solution supported a, a, a complete API, I can, you can build create a, a section and go and yep. just go completely A good example, wild. actually, Tim just did an integration at a, during a POC. They wanted to actually provision a fresh environment, Windows 2008 in this case, yeah, for legacy. Yeah. But they want to actually create a, a, a Windows 2008 server, promote it as a domain controller, then spin up eight web servers that join that domain, eight SQL servers and set up SQL server, but everything falling into that compliance with, with Active Directory and with that new completely isolated environment. We're able to do that and present those options via workflows into that multi-tiered application structure. So one click of a button, you had, what was it, 16 VMs up and running. Yeah. Um, Took a little while because it's Windows, but it, it, it actually went end-to-end -end and did the, the phase provisioning and gave you feedback as to where it was. So. Very, very awesome application, by the way. So this right here, this raw uh, YAML formatted data is what we submit to the API when we run Jenkins. So when Jenkins runs all its tests and it's done, every, it's done everything it needs to do, it's going to report back to Morpheus, and it's going to say, here's my application I want to deploy. Here's the way the application is going to look. Here's the cloud I want to go to. Here's how I want that to run. And here's all the parameters for that application. Now build the application out, deploy the application on Morpheus, and then take the application and deploy it after it's tested. And you can even take that and you can deploy that as an application, then test against it with Jenkins if you wanted to. So however you want to do that. But this is how we bundle everything in. So I'm gonna, this, is, this application has ran its uh, little piece here. So I'm going to go in here and let me get my web piece here. And so this is the IP I'm going to with my web. Like I said, this is very simple, Node.js. Uh, so it's basically saying this is Node.js. I'm running on container, container name. This is the database that I'm pointing to. This is the port on the database that I'm pointing to. And here's the database entries that I pulled. Just very simple database entries. And this is building the database, database out from scratch. This is building the components that talk to the database. And this is all from ground up. So anything you want to modify within these pieces, you modify through code. And once you push that code, then Jenkins takes it and runs with it. Simple, simple Jenkins pipelines at that point. And a, another piece to highlight on this is you see it, it knows what database to tie to in that two-tier application. It does have a subset of service discovery in it as well as support for things like console. So you can actually have it automatically register your services with console and tie in really complicated microservices architectures with that app templating structure as well. I guess in terms of understanding the scope of where you guys sit, and it goes back to the, the, the slide earlier on, the CI/CD pipeline is outside of your remit. You're like in terms of Jenkins and a pipeline and building the, the stages in that and test plans and those kind of things. You're just that commit happens, that trigger happens in Jenkins, and then but you're building the orchestration of what you'd spin up with that code afterwards. But then we're calling an API with the parameters of the application template. Then once we're when we when we have that application template deployed on Morpheus, then we're going to deploy that application template. So we're going to take that application template and deploy the instances the way we've defined it through Jenkins. Right. So your, your answer is right. Like Jenkins is doing the build and the test, right? Morpheus is facilitating easier ways to facilitate the deployment part, as well as enabling uh, more feature sets of more capabilities, what you can test. Maybe I want to test it across multiple environments. How does it run in Am Azure? Maybe I want to run a test on that. How does it run in Amazon? Things like that. But you oh. wouldn't necessarily run the test. The test, you, the you, test would you run. You'd pull back from, to Jenkins and say, I've right. that step in the pipeline and I've successfully executed, now run whatever test it is. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then Jenkins could then call back to uh, Morpheus to tear down that instance to finish that, that pipeline. And to Tim's question earlier about how, you know, how broad do you go? Where do you, know, where do you say no? Yeah, you yeah. know, that, that is a, you know, we're a deploy machine. Like that is, we're a very deployment centric automation tool. Um, not trying to keep creeping left to be, you know, a test suite and release automation, but we want to hook to hook into the major tools that, that we need to to affect our piece of that puzzle. Yeah, so that, that's actually um, relates to your question earlier about PaaS versus IaaS. Um, Morpheus started at the, what we, we like to say app-centric. It started at the app layer and moved outward both directions. So that's why you see a lot of this multi-tier application structure where it's, it's taking all these in, little integrations, all these pieces that you have to normally deal with individually and gluing them together and giving you an application-centric provisioning stack in a lot of ways. And then we've expanded out into infrastructure more and also expanded out into the analytics, things like that after. And how do you manage Steam and uh, versioning? How do we manage versioning? Yeah. We push it I push it through the Jenkins uh, push number. 
So it you can do it many it different is. ways. Yeah, so that he's using Docker registry. So it's using Docker and doing tagging, and then the app template, you can specify the version on deployment. You can also create catalog items that are versioned as well, which we didn't get time to drill into. So you can do it by VM templates or containers or code. So, so how do you guys integrate operationally with stuff that's not deployed through Mor Morpheus? So as I see, I just have brown, brownfield. This is a journey. Not, it takes a while to get there. So parts of my application, we, we can automate and use Morpheus for that orchestration. And as such, I'll get great feedback from uh, actual pricing from AWS, but I have stuff outside of Morpheus. It, it could be part of the same app. Mm -hmm. uh, that goes into that, uh, you saw those unmanaged VMs earlier, that goes into that brownfield ingestion. So if you're provisioning things outside of Morpheus, we can do a limited subset of capabilities on that. We can give you guidance recommendations. We have some customers that have uh, expiration <coughs> policies they apply. So things tear down or clean up that Morpheus can do on those. So you have a limited subset of capabilities you can do, but you also get the visibility of them as well. And then can I, from a relationship, from a state perspective and configuration management, associate those uh, unidentified VMs as part of an app? Yes. You can convert them to manage and yeah, them you? just like any application to your so once I've in, Once I've pulled them in, I can, mm -hmm. I mean, I manage them through Morpheus, but I can associate them with, right. with when, uh, application that Morpheus. Right. And when you do convert to manage, you get two options. You can install that agent if you want to. If you want to mm -hmm. get the advanced statistics, you can do that. Um, it's optional, and it'll create a generic instance for you that you can then represent in your application to your structure so you can get a visual representation, you can set up some monitoring against it, all that type of stuff with your brownfield. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, most of what we go into are brownfield, mm -hmm. you know, environments that are trying to get their act together around automation and, you know, centralize their multi-cloud management, mm -hmm. so for sure. Where are we at time-wise? I just want to... Minutes. Ten minutes. All right. This has been fantastic. Like I said, we could probably do a four-hour uh, block of time and not not get to it all. How much? Do you have anything else you wanted to cover here? Or are we? No, can... I just wanted to show that you know, as a developer, you could actually just submit code. You can update your code and have it present a new application for you in Morpheus. You don't have to tie into Morpheus. You don't have to go through the UI. You don't have to type on any of those buttons. This is all pretty easily done through uh, Jenkins setup and prep through API commits. I think because of where, again, where it came from, uh, you know, David's DevOps-centric nature, you know, the, the CLI, the API, very robust, I mean, almost. Yeah, so almost I, first. I kind of flexible where you guys want to go here. I could show you some of the CLI API real quick if we got 10 minutes, or do you we want can to talk do about a couple roadmap. roadmap things, a little API CLI, who, who, who wants to dictate the next 10? <laughs> I'd be interested, there's been an explosion in the last sort of six to 12 months of tools for managing Kubernetes um, and in NHA sets up and those kind of pieces. You look at the Pivotal piece, you look at um, Amazon with EKS, these pieces. Where, where do you sit? Because I've seen Kubernetes a few times there. Are you just deploying that and then letting someone else manage that, manage the HA components of that and, and make sure it, it... Right, so there's two ways we have. So one of them is you can actually just point Morpheus at a entirely, you've set up Kubernetes yourself, you've got a cluster, you can point it that way as a cloud and deploy to it. Um, the other way is we can build the Kubernetes cluster for you. I think we use, is it KADM to do that? So kind of the, the de facto installer tools to build Kubernetes. We call into that and actually build your cluster for you. So you can add nodes to the cluster, things like that. That's all built in. And then do you manage the the health of that cluster? So mm -hmm. if yeah. you see nodes die, you re and then are you, what infrastructure do you support building that on? And then do you tie into any of those? So if you're using EC2 or something like that, you're using ALBs to be the load balances of those pieces? Yep, exactly. So we can use ELBs, ALBs. We can actually do um, F5s, things like that. So all that type of stuff ties in. Uh, we do manage the cluster. If, if one does go down, we, we detect that. We won't deploy things to that anymore or that node. And we can also rebuild a new one and move things. So if someone had built that using Pivotal or something like that, you could tie into the native uh, Kubernetes and deploy that way because mm -hmm. you don't care who's, how that's been built or right. you can build it yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Maybe we're taking a step back and just talking about our container journey. If yeah, we're so container first and then that's added. That's true. Um, one unique thing about Morpheus is when it was built, um, we actually built it container first. Docker was really t relatively young when it came out. Um, we had a lot of experience and we had other tooling for doing VM orchestration, but we started with Docker. Um, this gave us a leg up, but companies weren't yet ready for Docker. They didn't consider it production ready. We still had that problem. Now it's, it's kind of shifted. Uh, so we actually built our own engine. We have open vSwitch for cross-network linking. We have um, 
all the monitoring stuff you would need to manage a Docker cluster, uh, discovery, all that stuff is built into Morpheus. Now, what's happened nowadays is Kubernetes has kind of become the standard, um, and we now support Kubernetes, and that was very easy for us to do. It was a very easy lift and shift. So we can support both still. Uh, it's very easy to move them. A lot of the concepts Kubernetes has implemented was in our orchestrator. Um, so it was pretty easy to do that from an abstraction perspective. It also gave us advantage. We had these customers who started using us for VM orchestration. They go, wait, we want to start exploring Docker. Um, we were already there and ready to go. So it wasn't kind of a tack on after the fact, which you do see sometimes nowadays with uh, legacy VM architecture type things. And do you think it's possible to monitor the, the API timeout? Because uh, in serverless infrastructure, I think this is a security leak uh, uh, made by developers mainly, who used to, uh, to put uh, timeout as infinite because uh, it's easier for, us, for them. But for the administrator, it's not totally easier to uh, manage the security in this case. So it uh, could be... Uh, could could be good to uh, monitor this timeout because just check the email uh, file or the log file. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you can highly customize some of the monitoring. I don't know in your specific use case, I'd have to think about it a little bit to kind of give you a full answer on that. Um, but there's a lot of different pluggable monitoring capabilities. You saw the workflow stuff. I didn't get to drill into that where you can add a ton of requirements into that. So. Yeah. Um, that's kind of ties in governance and stuff. I don't have enough time to kind of go into that. That's the, the Data important areas, part. I mean, there's a lot, yeah, the monitoring, as they've mentioned, we've, one, yeah. of the, one of the design philosophies for a lot of the services was to have a native, you know, a native service out of the box from right. Morpheus, or if somebody had a existing tool that they wanted us to plug into, we'd plug it into it. So right. monitoring, logging, you know, backup policies, um, one of the slides I showed that you guys can get has a little tiny little Morpheus icon over all those. That's where we have a native out of the box. Mm -hmm. And that monitoring has hierarchy, so you can see availability. Like if something like you have five Tomcats, one goes down, you can properly calculate your customer availability. You can actually do checks that are aware of what service is running. So say I want to actually monitor my queue sizes in a RabbitMQ or something like that. You can build checks that do that and alert at different thresholds and queues. Um, the same goes with. Uh, MySQL, Postgres, there are SNMP track checks, there's um, custom code checks where you can write your own script and actually run that, so there's different things you can do. What about billing? You showed us pricing, yeah. but what about billing? So uh, billing, right now we have a billing API engine, so normally it extracts out, so a customer typically, managed service providers are more of the people that use that feature, they already have a billing engine, so we provide an API for them to pull that data out and put it into their billing engine. So. Okay. So you, kind of you, do, you wouldn't do that directly for the customer? Not typically, no. Right. We are constantly enhancing like the reporting and being able to do exports and you know, dump right. CSV and tag things. And so we, that's, as we've, that's not like a new integration request, but some of the things that have come up as we're in more complex environments, they have some specific requests around reporting. And so we're constantly improving that. Right. Yeah, I'm just thinking that you're, you're sort of abstracting the need to go to different clouds to do things. <laughs> except when you get to building where you've got to go to the different clouds to do things. Um, is that well, correct or is that wrong? No, because we do ag we have all the billing data. So you are, you're, so you are aggregating. Right, but we don't have like, we'll send the invoice out to the customer. We don't do that. <coughs> yeah, no, fair, no enough. fair enough. I, I wasn't yeah. meaning that. I was meaning, yeah. were you aggregating the data yeah. so that people didn't have to go? Oh, yeah. Yep. Go and, and tying it back to groups, roles, right. projects, tags, you know, you all are, of the. You are doing it, yeah. Yep. I, I wouldn't expect you to be. Right. <laughs> Printing and sending letters out or whatever. Yeah. But Tim's worried about us going too broad and you're right. Yeah, yeah. There's a cost, <laughs> where there's a cost usage report where you can get like the fine grain stuff and then there's a fine grain, uh, an API where you can do different filters and extract that data and then right. a lot yeah, of our right. MSPs will take that and tie it into. If I actually, pro if I'm doing billing properly, like MSPs have to because that's how they make money, which means they actually do it properly as distinct from IT organizations, don't yeah. do it properly because they have no incentives to, no. which is, you know, yeah, there's a long, we won't go down that rabbit hole. Um, <coughs> but I, I actually like that you don't do that and say, no, no, no there are billing engines because billing stuff is complex. And I just want the aggregated thing. data. I don't yeah. have to go off and go and get it from yeah. everywhere yep. because I'm not doing all of the separate stuff to provision stuff everywhere. Yes. The platform's doing it, so the platform should be. It already has data. that info, so I should be able to That's expose fine. it. Which, yeah. So the fact right. that you can. It, it, it is there and can be exposed through an API and provided yeah. to other dedicated tools, yeah, is, is good. If you define all like your that. logical groupings 
of how your teams work and the tenancy and everything in Morpheus, and you want to tie the data back to that, which it sounds like the billing data right. back to that, so you can build those groups. So you don't want to define it twice. Yeah. And there's multi-currency support. There's currency conversion estimating where we'll visualize the currency if they don't bill like Amazon bills in dollars, but maybe you want to see it in euro or pounds, you can see that. Type yeah. of the, one, okay. the one thing I find kind of interesting is when you started the conversation about what Morpheus does, mm -hmm. and you showed that slide with all the different products, mm -hmm. and where we've gotten to now, one of the takeaways is you're, you're really a governance engine for net new development. So being able to put together the templates for using certain services. I'm having trouble reconciling those two because when I'm trying to bring that sprawl in, that sprawl has already happened and I'm trying to bring it in, but the net new, I have tech traditionally have much more control over that. Um, so, I mean, that's just something you might want to take away and kind of think about how you reconcile those two. Because if, if it's just about managing um, net new development, mm -hmm. there are a lot of very simple, clever ways to do that. But if it's truly to bring in all of these complicated use cases and complicated solutions together, then you have to figure out how to get that existing workload into the mix.